check, check.
Good morning, Wellspring. It's good to see y'all today. I'm Jessica Peterson. I'm the associate pastor. And I'm Jeff Smith. I'm the senior pastor. And it's a joy to welcome all of you here today. To our visitors, we want to issue a very special word of welcome. Uh, we are Wellspring. We are the place where all are welcome, all are accepted, all are loved, and all means all. And we are so glad to have you with us. For those who are worshiping with us online, we welcome you as well. We're glad that you're worshiping with us, and uh, and we want to want you to to encourage you to please click the words "see more" where you see uh, it, uh, on Facebook, and it opens up uh, a larger box there, and there you can find links to register your attendance and make your gifts, and find a link to uh, to the uh, the prayer concerns. You can find multiple links there, including to our e news, which we'll talk about further in a minute. For those who are online with us also, uh, apologies for last week. Uh, that was a, a, we had internet issues for the last two weeks that were beyond our building that kept, kept uh, dropping us and, and cutting us off. So we have that, uh, that seems to be resolved this week. And, but, but if you go down, if we go down, we have a backup. So just stay with us, we'll be back. So um, we're working, working to make sure we have backups in place. Um, and then to everyone in the room, we want to encourage you to please register your attendance on the blue cards uh, that you have, or you can use Shelby next, uh, or you can use the lower right portion of, your, of the back of your bulletin. If you use a QR code, you can do the same as what our online attendees do. You can register your attendance and you can make, your, uh, make a gift there. Also, uh, you have the place to subscribe to the e-news uh, that is, uh, is also important. And uh, we do want to remind everyone that we're, we're at our pledge campaign. And uh, the, this is our pledge Sunday. We'll be, ble we'll be uh, consecrating our, our giving. Doesn't mean that if you haven't made your pledge after today, you can still do so. Uh, but we do want, encourage, and one of the things I've, I've had someone ask me if, if their pledge uh, simply goes year to year, it does not. It's an annual pledge. So if you pledge this current year, uh, we, we still are asking for pledges for the next year because, so we encourage you to fill that out. Uh, you see on the screen how we've, uh, uh, it's our web page is the easy way to do it. Uh, on the front of our web page is a link that simply says uh, uh, you're pledging and, and there you have submit your pledge and that's on our front of our web page and then it's intuitive from there. It takes you into the, takes you in through it all. If you need a per paper copy, if you'd rather, if you're old school like some of us are and prefer a paper pledge and you need that, raise your hand. We have some. Uh, we, we have some. So we have one right here and one over here here up front and so paper pledge you can fill that out and then you can place that in the offering plate whenever the offering plate comes around so so that's going to be an important thing um, and so we have uh, so many things going on and so uh, just want to encourage everyone to be sure that they're looking at our e-news that's where details are and Jessica is going to going to lead us in that. Yeah, another reminder for our online worshipers today is Communion Sunday. So if you're at home, uh, gather uh, something that will remind you of the body and blood of Christ so that you can have that with you later in worship when it's time for Communion. Um, a few announcements. We're continuing to take a special offering for hurricane relief. Um, all those funds will go to UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, and you can um, designate your gift as hurricane relief either online or if you put your gift in the offering plate. We have a new study beginning October 10th. It's called Knowing Who We Are, The Wesleyan Way of Grace. It's facilitated by Reverend Bernie Sandberg, and it will be on Thursdays at 2 p.m. And that starts this Thursday. So if you think October 10th is far, register today, because we need you to register today. Um, Wellspring shirts are in if you ordered one, or if you didn't order one, I know there's extras. So go see uh, Becky at the table out there um, and grab your t-shirt. Um, Trunk or Treat is coming on October 27th. We need volunteers to support this event that we do in uh, partnership with the YMCA for our community. So if you want to volunteer in some way, contact Frank. Um, and we have a special announcement today from Becky Ash about the Georgetown Pride Festival. Come on up here so everybody oh. can see you. All right. Good morning. Um, so... 
Jeff already said, all are welcome, all are accepted, all are loved, and all means all. So those are the words that we say every time we come into worship here at Wellspring. All means all. So thank you for living out these words by generous, generously supporting our sponsorship of Georgetown Pride Festival. As a result of your support, we were able to give $1,000 to Georgetown Pride, and we will have a presence at the festival supporting an interfaith kids space and crafting booth with San Gabriel Unitarian Universalist Church. But our work is not done. Um, so our call to action, <laughs> we do not have enough volunteers. So you can visit the table in Brightwell, either look for me, Becky Ash, or Becky Hauser, uh, after this service to sign up for a slot and be a witness of God's love in our community. Sometimes these events can be a little um, maybe intimidating the first time you volunteer for it. I will be there with you the entire time if you do volunteer. So if you wanna do an hour, if you wanna do two hours, if you wanna do 30 minutes, give me lunch, that would be fantastic. So please come out and help support us. Um, thank you. When is it, Becky? Oh, sorry, it is next Sunday, October 13th for the full day, 12 to seven, thanks. <laughs> You're good. Today, on this World Communion Sunday, we gather at this table that you see with bread from all across the world, and we gather at this table with our siblings in Christ across the world. There is one body and one spirit. We gather as a people who can see beyond the present suffering, who envision the kingdom of heaven on earth. We are called in one hope. Though we express our faith in different ways, the authentic Christ within each of us unites us and shows us the way. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and parent of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. Then let us worship God together as one.
seated. Christ our Lord invites to this table all who love him all across the world, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Our gospel reading for today comes from the gospel of Mark, and so I invite you to stand as we prepare to hear God's word for us today. Hear these words from Mark 10, verses 2 through 16. Some, testing him, asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing children to him in order that he might touch them, and the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated.
One of my favorite stories, and I think I've told this here some time ago, but it's a, a story about this man who had fallen from a ship, from a cruise ship, and had made himself and found his way to this small deserted island where he waited for rescue. And so uh, he lived there for almost three years when he finally spotted a small ship that and was able to send up smoke and, and draw that, that vessel to them. And uh, then when the boat's captain came ashore uh, to rescue him, the, the whole story spilled out about what happened to this castaway, how he had fallen from the, from the ship and how he was able to make it to this little island. And as the captain looked at the scene, what he saw were three huts. And they were well-maintained. And so he asked the man what he was seeing, why he had three different dwellings. And the castaway said, well, the house in the middle is my home. And, the, 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 it's, and then the one to the left of it is my church. It's where I go to pray and worship. And the captain was curious and said, what about the, the, the third hut? And the man put his hand up to his face with a whisper and said, that's my old church. The rules there were too strict and I'm not allowed to go there anymore. <laughs> I think we tend to miss the point <laughs> that the lines we draw and the way we marginalize people is not something that happens out there. It's something that apparently, according to that story, happens within. And I think this speaks to how we cut ourselves off from one another and from the God of all grace. Let us pray. God, we pray that you be with us in our worship here together. And as we celebrate this World Communion Sunday and seek to experience a world of belonging, and unity, we ask that you help lead us there. So may now the words that we share here together in the meditations of our collective heart be acceptable in your sight, for you, O God, alone are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So first, a big thank you to uh, Reverend Mel Hazelwood for taking this text from Mark just prior to this passage and what he shared with you last week helped set the stage for where we're going this week. And as Mel unpacked the, the need to care for the little ones, you'll see that what you heard last week really connects between two instances uh, where he fell just inside of the, the, the other bookend, but two instances of talking about children. So last week's te text takes place in the northern part of Galilee in and around Capernaum. And this week, according to Mark 10, 1, which we did not read, we started with the second verse, uh, Jesus and his followers have moved to the region in, of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And it's here that we, we move into this place where we're in the Decapolis. So we're in the, the 10 cities that are not, that, that are Gentile cities, that are, are not part of the Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, realm in any real way. And so here's where we get into this text where we think that the topic has now changed. So Jesus has talked about not putting stumbling blocks in front of the little ones and those who are, those who are for us cannot soon be against us, if you recall from last week. And now we have, uh, and, and it begins with the disciples arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And before this, this Mel's text, the, the argument unfolds, and then Jesus puts a child in their midst and tells them that they have to be like that child. And so what you heard last week followed that episode. The Apostle John then tells us that they saw someone casting out demons, and th this is where Mel shared with you that they asked him to stop, and because they were not following Jesus, and Jesus has admonished them not to put stumbling blocks and not to be stumbling blocks in front of these little ones. Remember what happens to those who are stumbling blocks? Remember millstones, neck, sea, the, you know, things that don't go well together for us. And then we're told here that, uh, that Jesus went to Judea beyond the Jordan. And so he's moved and we're told that he's being tested. And it's important to remember that fact because 
if, if it's not as if Jesus was walking along and just decided that he was going to start teaching about divorce or the definition of marriage. This is a test of Jesus' orthodoxy. Are you orthodox? And Jesus, uh, so the, the question is, Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And notice that it isn't a question about whether it's lawful to divorce. It doesn't ask a question about a woman divorcing her husband, which would have been permit, it could have been permissible in that day under certain circumstances, but it is specifically asking Jesus if he is going to stand up for this law of Moses and then this one law. And if not, then if he answers wrongly, then they can accuse him of blasphemy or they can, they can dismiss him, just walk away from him. And this is the same kind of litmus test that we have being asked in our world today. That is, whether we're talking politics or religion, but in, in religion, it's fundamentalists who continue to ask the question of, of those of us who see the gospel differently from them. The conservatives who left to form the new denomination of the United, in the, left the United Methodist Church to form another Methodist expression are those who kept testing the beliefs of others. And if we didn't fall in line, then we were unworthy to be called Christians, let alone Methodist, by many. The questioning itself was intended to be divisive and undermining. And it's not about building up. And I'm going to tell you, friends, that's the problem that we have today with Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism is all about dividing and determining who's in and who's out. And that is not Christian. That is not the message of Jesus Christ. That is not the message of our nation historically. So it's neither in our national interest nor is it a Christian expression. It is something that is to be divisive. It's something that brings us down. And so I think the same can be said here of those who are testing Jesus. They're not interested in the unifying power and ministry of Jesus. They are not interested in bringing people together. They are more interested in tearing us apart. And so they're trying to pick Jesus apart here. And Jesus, as Jesus always does, turns the question back with a question. What did Moses command you? What are you talking about? And they answered, Moses allowed the man to write a certificate of divorce, uh, of dismissal and divorce, and divorce her. And this is where Jesus then turns on them and he says, Moses gave you that because of the hardness of your own heart. You see, from the beginning of creation, and this is something else we're going to unpack here, we were called to be in union with one another and you were instead focused on tearing us apart. It's like the prenuptial agreement that I don't always understand because it's this agreement that assumes that the union can't last and that we're focused from the outset on divorce when perhaps we could better spend our times focused on what it means to create, in the words of a national document of ours, a more perfect union. And when we focus on division rather than unity, Jesus says we sin. It's the law, Mar, uh, Paul says, that's the, what the law does to us, is that if we're going to be, use the law to divide us according to who's in and who's out, then we sin, the, the, it's the law of sin and death, in, in Paul's words. And what Jesus also identifies is that the way the law is used was for the marginalization of women. What's happening here? Women have, uh, they're either considered property or they are simply left to themselves. And a woman in that day could, while well, she, she might be able to divorce her husband, it's more likely that it was the man who had the, 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 the law behind him to simply write it. I don't care why I'm just done with you and you're out. And then what would happen? The women would end up in poverty and the children would end up in poverty. So we have Jesus walking among these impoverished people in the Gentile region, people who are cut off, and the disciples are not really concerned about it. They, they see them as cut off. They see uh, the, 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 that division. They understand that's how the law works. But this also became a tool of control over women. Because the threat of divorce was a threat of poverty and marginalization. And women, 
you could imagine would rather submit sometimes to a, to a, a difficult marriage than to find themselves on the streets begging. So in many ways, this still happens in the world today. And it is hierarchical. It is this notion that there is a structure that starts with God and comes down through all these. If you're, looking, if you're Catholic, it's, it's God, Pope. You know, and coming down through the priesthood, and then you get to the average person, then you get to women, and then you get finally to children. And so, this hierarchical understanding is what is harming women here. And Jesus is a champion of women and migrants and children. And when he talks about how God intended the created order to be, he is talking about how God created us for each other. Additionally, If we then turn to use the text that reads, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh, that is a clobber text that has been used against LGBT uh, plus siblings. And when we do that, we really miss the mark. If we really want to hear what Jesus says, let's hear hear that one line. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. It's still in our marriage uh, ritual, our marriage rite that is, says, let no one put asunder. Let no one separate. And that's the crux of this passage. That's the crux of this passage. When we continually tear at the fabric of our shared DNA as human beings, we sin. And please understand that I'm not saying that divorce isn't a, a, can't be something good when the marriage, the relationship simply cannot thrive. I get that. And Jesus is about that same kind of grace. There are many people who discover that they are better apart than together. And this text in no way diminishes that reality. I want you to hear that very clearly. So I truly think the key to understanding this passage is going to fall in the place of vulnerability and love. That's where we have to start. The only lens through which to see this passage is, to, is when we see it through humility, vulnerability, love, then we hear that G, we see Jesus who stands with those who are vulnerable and how he, he, he sees how vulnerable women and children are so easily exploited in that day. But today, in our world, women are, and children are so easily exploited globally today. So as we we gather on this World Communion Sunday, we're talking about this kind of unity where we we lift up the shared DNA of everyone. And even when his disciples ask him about the law and they're alone, he says that using this law in this way leads to adultery, which I think is kind of interesting because it's like, oh, now we're talking about we sin. We sin. And what he says is that adultery, I mean, what, when you look at adultery as it's defined in Hebrew and Christian scripture, it is adultery is this symbol of unfaithfulness, of lack of unity, that we have a breakdown in our system where we think we are fixing it and we're not. And, and so he says that this breakdown of community, a word that literally means with unity, and that's what we're after. And because Mark is wanting to drive the point home, he brings the most vulnerable into the picture. People were bringing their children to Jesus, not just people. These were the poor, the people in the countryside, the people who were clamoring for some word of hope from, from this, this Christ. And so Jesus, they, they simply want Jesus to be able to touch them and the disciples say, hey, hang on, we are having a grown-up conversation here about marriage and divorce, and we don't have time for the kids, Okay. And we are told that Jesus was indignant, indignant over their response. Why? Because the disciples are still thinking hierarchically. Kids are at the very bottom. They just have to wait. And Jesus says, no, we're here to upend your hierarchy. We're here to turn this thing upside down. And it's the children who finally are the answer to the, this ludicrous obsession with power over and the marginalization of others. And it is about a new understanding of what power with is all about. Let the children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not 
receive the kingdom, this kingdom of God, like a little child, will never enter it. If we're going to live by hierarchy, we are missing it. We don't get that. We don't get how we can participate in the kingdom of God hierarchically, which is where nat Christian nationalism would lead us. Because I doubt anybody who is promoting Christian nationalism today is talking about children and talking about how they are called to be children. So read, Jesus is saying, read my lips. Read my lips. This is what I just talked to you about in the last chapter. And you still can't figure it out. And here again, it's about vulnerability. The children are here to teach us about how to live in this realm of God as one, as you, in unity. So what is it that children teach us? I think children teach us what it is to approach Jesus without fear. We put so much fear into religion, and it's our fear-based religion that has all but destroyed the message of Christ in this world. And we ask people to measure up to some standard that ensures that our own power is held intact. And when they, when they don't threaten them, um, and then when we, we, we threaten them with either being cut off from the church or with hellfire itself, then we get to have our power intact that we, we ultimately are trying to really cut them off from God in order to be able to maintain power over Children implicitly know that this is not true and that Jesus is the one who demonstrates a loving embrace. So last week, something funny happened. Um, it was a, I wasn't here in the morning, but I was here for my mother-in-law's memorial service that afternoon, and we were standing for, we were standing for, uh, for to have a, a meal uh, afterwards, and, and, uh, and I was offering a prayer. And my youngest grandson, who is turning two next month, he, he has not called me. I, I go by my, my grand, grandpa name is Pops. And, uh, but he doesn't say pops, he says pots. So, but, but he hadn't, but he hadn't even said that to me directly. I overhear him saying it somewhere and he walks over to me while I'm praying and while I'm doing the religious thing and he's standing at my knees and he's holding on to my knees and he's going pots, pots. And so that's the, the, it's, you know, it's, it's that moment when we realize, wow, this is what we're really about here. Children teach us about how to authentically be in relationship with one another, how we are to be in relationship with one another. When I see my own grandchildren play, they ran the, ran the full gamut of excitement, joy, laughter, tears, crying, uh, pushing apart from one another, despair over how someone isn't playing fair, and then they still see themselves in relationship with each other, and they will always have each other's backs. We live in a world where families and neighbors and communities are torn apart by things like our national rhetoric and divisiveness and anger and domination of one another in our faith communities. And when those who seek to divide us are long gone, our communities, neighborhoods, families are nothing but wreckage left behind because of these supersized egos and aspirations of power. Children can teach us how to overcome this kind of communal destruction. And finally, children teach us about vulnerability, which is the true key to unity. They teach us how to be open-hearted, how to live open-hearted. And they are willing to be real with us. And when we see children as more than political or social pawns then in our power games, then we will realize that they are capable of being the ones who can teach us about what true unity looks like if only we will pay attention. And they do this because they are relational and they exhibit what Jesus describes as, the, as, as how we are formed in the original family unit. We are made for one another. And it's only in our willingness to be vulnerable that we find that hope. Ours is a ministry that is intended to be based on this understanding. So when we talk about intergener intergenerational ministry, we're not talking just about us, the older of us teaching the children. We are talking about how it is that we learn from children. We have children who, who in the late service, especially this playground that is kind of looks kind of odd whenever we don't have children in the room, that thing's full in the late service. We have kids everywhere here. And so uh, we're seeking ways to deepen the centrality of children and youth in our ministry, not because they need it, but because we need it. So as we talk about financial support today, 
we're talking about undergirding those ministries. We're talking about how this is a gift of empowering the ministry of Christ. It's a ministry focused on how we can be the church where Christ is made known from the youngest to the oldest across all economic levels and through the witness of every single person who is touched by this ministry. And what better way to celebrate our giving than to do this on World Communion Sunday? This is where we are called to celebrate our unity amidst our diversity. This began in 1933 in the mind of Reverend Hugh Thomas Kerr, who was a moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, and he was pastor at Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. His idea took hold so that then, by the time we get through that depression, the, the Great Depression to 1940, the predecessor of the National Council of Churches said this is something we need to promote globally. We need to talk about how on one Sunday of the year we can talk about unity together and how we are asked to overlook our differences and consider that we need to be beyond this litmus test. So a friend of mine uh, who is someone who I've known for years and is like a brother to me was one of the ones who actually helped form a new Global Methodist Church, one of our, this, this sister denomination that split off from us. He did it in a way where he didn't try to take his own church. He simply went and formed one. And so we had lunch together after, uh, after my mother-in-law's death. And um, in that lunch where we all sat there, uh, we were, at first we went in like, we just don't need to talk politics and religion here. We'll all be okay, you know. <laughs> And then uh, at one point I realized that that just wasn't going to be authentic. We had to talk. And so I asked him how his church was going. And he began to talk about the ups and the downs. And, we, and, I, and even though he doesn't, he doesn't share my exuberance for our kind of church, uh, he, he heard me. And then, then in an effort to bridge, he began to talk about inclusiveness, about what inclusiveness can look like in his church and what it can look like in ours. And we began to see a pathway there's a pathway beyond our differences. It's a pathway that Christ is talking about here. And it's because, because Joe and I both can be children together. And we can look at each other and we can see what John Wesley said when he said, though we may not think alike, may we love alike. So friends, in that love, in that love, that is where we come to this table. Because this is the table of love, vulnerability, unity. It is the place where we meet Christ. Amen.
Friends, as we prepare to come to this table that Christ has made ready for us, let us join in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, all vulnerable God, creator of heaven and earth. You made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today, his family and all the world is joining at his table. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has, has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church throughout the world and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. So by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at at, at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, all vulnerable and loving God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. So those who are worshiping with us, I'm sorry, those who are assisting with communion, please come forward. And those who are worshiping with us online, this is the opportunity that you have to receive communion with us. So this is where you take that which represents the body of Christ and eat and that which represents the blood of Christ and drink.
So, friends, we gather at this table, and for those who, want, who have questions, this is a table that is open to every single person. Any who would come receive, the table of Christ receives us like Christ received the children. So we offer communion today in three different forms. So for those who uh, are at the two stations, the two primary stations, we use the method known as intinction, whereby you simply come and you present your hand and then you're given bread. And then you take that bread and you dip that in the cup and you eat the juice-soaked bread. And uh, for those who have gluten sensitivity or who are vegan, uh, we have this uh, station here where Marie is holding the wafers. You come and take that from the, the plate, you dip that in the cup, and you eat the wafer, the juice-soaked wafer. For those who are concerned about germs in today's world, which is still a thing, uh, you're invited to come where Marie is and to receive one of our uh, self-contained elements that are here and you peel back the top layer and you have the wafer, peel back the second layer and you have the juice. And so you're invited to come and receive this gift in whatever way, whatever way you wish and our ushers will be bringing you forward.
Let us join our voices together as we give thanks for this meal and this gift that we have received. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So as our ushers come forward, I wanted to share with you uh, that uh, something that I intended to share at the beginning and neglected to do is that we haven't we had an update on our pledge of where we are, people who pledge in advance of today, that as, as we start today, we have 39% of our budget met. We have 203000 out of our $530,000 uh, target. So we have 39% uh, of the pledge goal, I should say. So um, that's something that we celebrate, uh, those who have already done so, but then also for you to consider how it is that you will support, and we offer then these, our offerings now. So let us pray. God, who calls us to an abundant and abiding ministry, be with us now as we make our gifts to you. We pray that you bless us with the power and the strength of your Holy Spirit, that that which we carry out here today and through this ministry throughout the year, that we are fulfilling your mandate to be in this world as Jesus followers. So empower us in our giving, and we give you thanks for these, that, these gifts that we receive. May those who are impacted by the, the power of this giving Feel your mercy running through their, their veins. So be with us now. Bless us as we give. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So Frank and Gentry, we have these who are coming forward to, to, to be with us. So as we, um, as we prepare to receive, uh, to consecrate our pledges, I invite you to do something. I like to pray with my hands open. So would, if you would join me with, with just palms up and we assume this place of prayer then I invite you just to, to join in as Frank and Gentry lead us in prayer. 
God, we thank you for calling us to be disciples of Jesus Christ who love everyone by. One, being in relationship with God, one another, and the community through mission and service. Two, actively pursuing diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation with an emphasis on being a welcoming church home for all. And three, engaging people of all ages in dynamic intergenerational ministries that nurture spiritual growth. Now join me in a moment of silent prayer as we pray for the ministries of the church that our giving supports. I invite you now to join me in this prayer of consecration that you find on the screens. Lord God, we, we offer these our commitments for the coming year. Bless our pledges and multiply their impact that the work of your church will glorify you. May the work of Christ be fulfilled in our giving. Amen. So now as we prepare to sing our hymn of invitation, we ask the same question every week. How about it, church? <laughs> How are you called to receive and live out the kingdom of God as a little child? Consider that as we sing. Before we pronounce the benediction, we don't always talk about symbols that we wear, but I want you all to know that this was a very intentional choice. Jessica is wearing her kids stole that is, uh, th th that, is that reminder to us. And my stole is a stole that is, it was made in Guatemala, but it is a stole that represents cultures uh, from around the world. So we, we seek to be that place where we recognize that unity and we celebrate that even within our own fellowship. So go be that church. Mm -hmm. Go celebrate who God is calling you to be, that you might truly be those who love and transform this world as vulnerable children of the living God. In the name of the one who created us, the one who, who redeemed us, and the one who now sends us forth. Amen.
wonderful week.